Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mengs. Mm -mm -mm. And today I welcome you guys to another Advanced Wars replay commentary. You guys really seem to enjoy the last one I did, so here's another. I'm really glad that you guys seem to be getting a lot of enjoyment out of this because I absolutely love doing this. So, um, today I'm bringing you guys an incredibly intense game. This is a very high skill game. The last uh, replay commentary that I showed against the Eagle Fanboy, he was a very beginner level player and so he did a lot of beginner mistakes and I figured that was a good game to show you guys like some things to avoid if you're new. But this game is going to be on an entirely different level. My opponent here has clearly played a lot of Advanced Wars multiplayer and he played extremely well. Now he still made some mistakes, but they are a lot more subtle. Uh, but this is a good example of how little tiny mistakes can lead to very big things in Advanced Wars. Now there are four lessons that I want to impart in this game. The first one is how incredibly important Battlecopters are in multiplayer. Like you will see in this game just how big of a role they play. The second is how important it is to hold comb towers. There are comb towers on this map. Uh, basically, when you capture them, you get a 10% firepower boost. This is a feature included in Dual Strike, but they are present on some of the maps in Advanced Wars by Web 2. And you will just see how incredibly important it is to hold these comb towers. The third lesson that I want to impart is just how devastating Adder's little power can be. <laughs> Oh boy, you'll see in this map just how much value I can get out of this power. It is incredibly good. And the fourth one is actually that mech spamming is not always the answer. And so, so this ended up being an incredibly interesting match and I can't wait to show it to you guys. First off, let's talk about the COs. I'm once again playing Adder. I'm sorry if this is a little repetitive. Uh, I'm gonna try to mix it up a little bit for future games, but I do love playing Adder, especially on smaller maps. My opponent is actually playing Rachel, which is a dual strike CO. Now in Advanced Wars by Web, uh, you can actually pick COs from all the games, but uh, if you play an Advanced Wars 2 CO, they will usually use their Advanced Wars 2 rule set. But Rachel, of course, is a dual strike CO. And she's an incredibly good one. Now, uh, I'm currently working on an Advanced Wars Dual Strike tier list. It's not out yet, but it will be soon. Uh, but I rate Rachel very high, highly because she has one of the best superpowers in the game. Now, her day-to-day -day power is not all that impressive. She gets one extra repairs back from properties, which is... Eh, it's not that great. Uh, it's a situationally can be useful sometimes, but for the most part, you don't really want to take advantage of this because she also pays more. You see, uh, her her normal power is absolute garbage. Never use it. It's a it's a low powered version of Nell's Lucky Star. It costs the same and it has the same tooltip description, but it's actually way worse. Nell's Lucky Star sets her luck rating to 60. Lucky Lass sets Rachel's luck value to 40. So it's statistically just way worse. On average, you will get a 20% firepower increase out of this normal power. So definitely do not <laughs> use it. What you want to do with Rachel is you want to use her superpower covering fire. It is so incredibly good. It fires three missiles at your opponents. It has around the same AI as Meteor Strike used to have. It's a little bit different. The first missile will hit infantry. The second missile will do cost effective damage. And the third missile will just try to deal HP damage. But statistically, considering it does nine HP total spread out over the map, it, it's almost like a Meteor Strike. It, it, it is very comparable in value. So. This is an extremely good superpower. So against Rachel, you want to press your advantage early on, which is what I'm going to do in this game. Now, quickly taking a look at this map, it's a very interesting map. Each player has two bases on each side right here, so you kind of have a left front and a right front, and on each side of the map is a comb tower. You definitely want to try to hold these as much as possible. As I said, you get a 10% firepower increase whenever you hold the comb towers. They become extremely important objectives to try and take, and they're located in the middle so that both players will constantly be fighting over them. There are another neutral base uh, available for each player in the middle of the map, so you'll have three bases on the small map, which is, I think, is a good number. And there are also tons of properties, lots of forest, a lot of mountains, so mechs are really strong on this map. Now, a lot of people wanted to know what these little things were in my previous uh, replay commentary. So these, this is something that, that Advanced Wars by Web does in a lot of its maps, and I actually like it a lot. So these terrain types actually do exist in the game, it's just that you don't usually see them on the map by default. So whenever you fire a missile from a missile silo, the property that gets left behind after the silo is gone is this little weird thing here. It's kind of like a city, but it can't be captured. But it has three defense stars. I do believe Candy still gets firepower bonuses on it. I think it's treated as a city. So basically, consider it just a regular neutral piece of terrain with three defense stars. Uh, I kind of like this because it gives the player some more cover to take without giving them more income. So it's actually a pretty clever way to utilize the, uh, the terrain that's already in the game. But yeah, this is a fantastic map. It's quite small, so statistically Rachel will not get that many superpowers. I, I would say she gets uh, more effective on larger maps. So she's not as strong as she usually is, but it's still going to be quite an uphill battle for me. And I definitely felt the pressure on this map because I'm up against a very good opponent. So let's begin. 
So, um, I start off right here uh, by building an infantry. Not very surprising, honestly. Like, <laughs> you, you want to start off building infantry in most of the matches you are in. And my opponent does the same thing. Now, my opponent does start off with an extra infantry. A lot of people wanted to know why the Advanced Wars by Web does this. Um, the player one has a big advantage in Advanced Wars because uh, they get an initiative bonus. It's like playing the white player in chess, right? Uh, white goes before black, so white, go white gets an initiative move. Uh, that's why you want to give the second player an extra infantry to balance this out. If you ever played Hearthstone, you know how the second player gets the coin? Well, this is kind of the similar concept. Like, you get an infantry, so you can move that infantry on turn one, so that offsets a little bit of the disadvantage you're at by starting second. So that is why. So he moves his infantry out, like, completely standard play here. I decided to go for the airport really early on because I see the close proximity of this airport to this comm tower, and I realize that battlecopters are going to be insane on this map, so I want to get that airport really quickly. You still get a thousand income from each airport, so there's no sense in not going for them over a city if you can. And I move my other infantry towards this base right here. So, his turn rolls in, and uh, yep, yeah, he has the same idea. He wants to capture this base early on, and he wants to capture this airport early on. So yeah, he's doing everything right here. I got nothing to say about his movements. They all make sense. I go for the airport, and uh, I move towards the comm tower. Now, I've already decided that how I'm going to try and win this match, since I'm up against Rachel, which is statistically a more powerful seal than I am, my goal, my game plan is to try and take one of the comp towers early and then prevent my opponent from getting his comp tower. That is how I'm going to try and win this match. I don't have any aspirations of taking both of them, but I want to have one and then deny him the other. That gives me a 10% firepower advantage, and that will statistically probably make up for the value lost when the covering fire eventually rolls in later. So I go for the base, which is, you know, you want to do this. This is incredibly important. And now it is day three. So... Once again, uh, my opponent goes for the airport, moves back to take the city, a little bit of a weird move. I would probably instead move out to take some of the contested properties, but he, maybe he wanted some early income, that could, always be, uh, that could always be a possibility. But he goes for the base, and that's honestly the most important thing. And he builds a recon really early on. I build a recon too. So uh, we both decided to go aggressive on this map. We both decided to go really aggressive on this map. I want to get a recon out because I want to take this tower. I think my opponent has the same idea here, so we both go early recon. So that should mostly balance each other out, uh, unless one of us goes two recons, which is an even more aggressive opener. But you can both tell that both of us really want this comm tower right here. So it's going to be a pretty intense match. Now I move my recon up. I put it in the forests. Um, it's this this uh, map features a lot of rough terrain. There's some roads, but the roads are a bit weirdly placed, so it's not as always as easy to get a lot of mobility for your recons on this map. But um, they, at least you have a lot of forests to hide them in, so that's pretty good. So I go for my base, I move up, I want to try and get this comm tower as well. Of course, at, at, I'm probably not going to get it, but at least I'm going to prevent him from getting it. That's my idea. So he moves his recon as well. He decides to not hide it in the forest, rather opt in to put it closer to the comm tower, which is a pretty good move. And he captures his base, and he continues to take properties. So his capture game is pretty good right now. He has 7,000 income to my 4,000, so his capture game is actually a lot stronger than mine at this point. So uh, I move my recon up here, and it's hidden by the day four, but so this is a pretty bad move on my end. Um, I move my recon up here because I want to scout his base. Statistically, not very good for me. Uh, I should have probably moved my, uh, my recon up here instead, like he did. Uh, I wanted to utilize the movement of the road and scout at his base to see what he was building, but of course it's just an infantry, I should have expected that. So as a result, my recon is kind of out of position right now. And that's not good. Also, kind of cool uh, th thing that I'm noticing here is if you actually click on the unit three times, you can see their vision range, which is actually pretty cool. You see their movement range, their attack range, and their vision range, which I really like that. that, that that's actually a really good feature. I wish Advanced Wars, um, the regular Advanced Wars games had this as well. So here I go for the comm tower, not seeing the recon. I'm expecting him to interrupt it, but at least I'm going to apply pressure to it. And I do another kind of weird mistake here. I move my infantry down here to get this property. Probably should have moved it up to reinforce my, my infantry cap in the comm tower. But at this point, I wanted some more income because I'm only getting 4,000 per turn right now, which is kind of bad. Now, I'm not seeing how much income he's getting because it's fog of war, but 4,000 is not that great on this map. So I go for another property. I realize I need to get some early economy going. So here I go for the comm tower, and I'm very surprised to see that he has not started capping it yet. So I'm like, okay, maybe I can try capping it. You never know. I build a recon just in case uh, he will, you know, I, I want to apply some extra pressure here. Um, I see that he has no no infantry here, and I see that I'm probably going to get this comm tower right here. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm just going to press my advantage here and go super aggressive. 
So day five rolls around and expectedly, uh, this recon interrupts my cap. I probably should have seen this coming. And here I'm really ang angry at myself because this recon is completely out of position to deal with this recon. I don't know why I just didn't just move it up here. This was a huge mistake on my end. Uh, definitely, I'm very, I'm very upset with myself right now. So, because now I'm not going to be able to get this comb tower. And if I had this recon over here, at least I would have been able to challenge his recon and get the first strike on it. So, yeah, big mistake on my end. He built some mech. Uh, solid move here. He really loves his mechs on this map. And they're pretty good. There's a lot of forest for them to shoot at, as you can see right here. So, not a bad idea to build mechs. But you will see later on why actually his mech spamming ended up hurting him. So... He continues to cap, he's way ahead of me in properties right now, 8,000 to my 5,000, so I, I really need to up my capture game here. He is going to statistically have a big advantage over me if, he, if this keeps on going. So uh, he builds another recon, so again, he too is getting very aggressive here. Two recons on the right hand side, I have two recons too, but they're split on e either side. So this guy, he is, he is really going to be aggressive early on, he is not going to just let me roll over him in the early game. So my turn rolls in, and I'm moving here, and... Here you can see, he did a massive mistake. So see this infantry? This infantry used, was capping this airport on the previous turn. So he decided to move and take this property. So he got greedy, and he wanted to get this property instead. So now, he is just giving me this, this comm tower right here. Huge mistake. He has no infantry in range to interrupt this. He, he just handed me the comm tower. That's a 10% firepower bonus that I have now over him. And that is going to be incredibly difficult for him to go up against. Because, again, Advanced Wars, when both sides are equal, tiny modifiers makes all the difference. So, here, instead of going and capping the city, he should have sent his infantry down here to make sure that no one took this common tower. So, that's the first massive mistake he makes in this match. But, he's doing a good job over on the right-hand side. He's interrupting my cap. Now, I move my infantry into the forest. There's no sense in leaving it here. It's just gonna die. I'm a little bit annoyed, though, because I probably should have pulled it back to this forest tile instead, instead of this one, because he has an infantry here. He can move that down, scout the infantry, kill the infantry with my recon. If I had moved it over to this forest tile, he wouldn't have been able to do that anymore. So, kind of annoying, but hey. So, I move my infantry up now. I'm taking more properties. He's still ahead of me in income, uh, but I'm kind of... I'm closing in the gap right now. And here, I'm already moving my first infantry towards the center of the map. One of the biggest mistakes that my opponent did here was that he did not go for the center enough. There are four properties here just waiting to be captured, juicy income just sitting here waiting to be snagged. Ignoring the center is going to put you at a huge eco disadvantage. So once again, I just build infantry. Uh, I'm saving up money now for a Battlecopter next turn. I see that I have an income of 8,000, so as long as I have a little bit of uh, money in the bank, then I'll be able to get that Battlecopter out next turn. But I also want to save enough money so that I can build two more infantry on the next turn. Remember, always, always, always build infantry in your bases. This is incredibly important. You want as many infantry on the map as possible. They're the most important unit in Advanced Wars. So, Day 6 rolls in. And he has successfully warded off my infantry from the comm tower, but he feels very good about himself right now. But he is making a crucial mistake. He's completely ignoring the side. It's very, very bad. However, he's moving his mechs in. Again, it's another one of his... He moves a little bit strangely sometimes. He moves his mech into this mountain. Why not move it down here? Mechs can move to movement through mountains, so why not put it here? You'd be able to see further. You would have more range. You'd be able to threaten uh, these areas right here. I don't understand why he m just moved the mech one space down. Mechs are already very limited in mobility. To move them even less than they're able to move in a turn is really strange to me. But again, he, he had this weird tendency to play very defensive at certain point in the match where I feel like he shouldn't. So he moves his infantry here over to the mountain. This is a, another, another mistake. He should have seen that I pulled my infantry back, so he should have used this infantry to sp spot the infantry and kill it with a recon. Killing an infantry in the early game is extremely devastating. It's like losing a villager in Age of Empires or like a worker in StarCraft, you know. Killing an infantry in the early game, that sets your opponent back a lot, income-wise. So any any possibility you have to kill the infantry um, is, is, is an, a, pos a possibility you should take. And... He, if he moved this infantry down, he could have statistically, if he, let's say, if, let's say if he attacked from here, the spot, and he had an infantry in this spot, he could have warded my my recon away with his mech. So he could have he could have set up a perfect formation here where he could have taken out my infantry and I would not have been able to take engagement safely against his recon out of fear that this mech would have taken down my recon. So again, his positioning is a little off here. So he moves in with the second recon, I see it. And now I realize that, okay, this is the time for Battlecopters right here, because he has two recons and no anti-air in sight, so this is great. Now, uh, he continues his capping game, nothing out of the ordinary here, he moves really well. 
And he builds a tank on the sand side, uh, which is, you know, there's good intuition on his end. He probably realized that I have some troops in this area. He doesn't see anything, but he should realize that there's, there's might maybe be a recon lurking around the fog here. So it's not a bad move on him to build a tank here. Um, so my turn rolls in and here you will see I make a massive big mistake. And I always make this mistake in my multiplayer matches. Can you see it? Can you see what I'm doing here? So I'm attacking. But I didn't capture the comb tower first. This is I do this all the time, and it annoys the living hell out of me. I have a I have such a bad habit of forgetting to capture my comb towers before I take engagements. I'm really eager. I really like to take engagements early on. And always, 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 always capture your comb towers before you do anything else, because they give you a 10% firepower increase. This recon could have been knocked down to 6 HP probably with that boost. Uh, tiny tiny difference, but you, in a game of Advanced Wars where both COs are very equal, tiny differences is what's going to end up winning you the match. So, again, incredibly important. Always cap your comm towers before you do anything. So here comes the Battlecopter. He can see it. I was a little bit annoyed that, that he had this recon here because it means he scouted the Battlecopter. Uh, Battlecopters are always much more effective if your opponents do not see them coming. But I still decide to build it anyway because I know he has a second recon, which means he didn't build an anti this turn. So this Battlecopter will statistically get one turn to be very effective. And you will see just how effective this Battlecopter ends up being. So I move my infantry back to the mountains to scout a little bit. I realize this probably means it will die, but I just want the vision. I want to see what's coming. Um, so yeah, once again, I just continue capturing. And now I'm starting on the properties in the center. He has not begun doing that yet, which is a big mistake on his end. Um... I move in, and here, I think I notice, yeah, let's see, there we go. So here, I'm noticing that, oh my god, uh, I did not take this comp tower, and I'm really, I'm really angry at this point. I'm like, oh my god, what am I doing? And I get myself trapped too, which is another big mistake. I should have expected there to be infantry here. I don't know why I thought there wouldn't be. I probably should have moved this recon into this forest instead, just to set it up, because I know that would have also give me a vision of the airport, so don't really know why I did this. A little bit of a sloppy play on my end. Again, I did I make I made lots of mistakes in this match too. So day seven rolls in here. And uh, he pulls his recon back wisely. He knows the Battlecopter is coming. So this was a good move on his end. He puts his other recon behind his first one, uh, getting it ready to attack. I understand he wants to stay out of range of this Battlecopter, so this makes com complete sense. He's playing really well here. Um, he continues to capture. He moves his infantry up into this mountain. And now he sees that I have the Comb Tower. And I'm guessing at this point he's probably pretty mad at himself for not going for the Comb Tower early on. But he rolls in with a tank, and this tank is going to be quite effective. He builds a recon, because he realizes he needs to apply pressure on this side of the map, and he continues to capture properties. Takes up my infantry in the mountains, really annoying, limits my vision. And he builds a mech here. Now, he didn't have that much money left, because he built a recon here, but honestly, this... I probably would have foregone the mech and the recon to get an anti-air out. Because now he's pretty much just allowing my Battlecopter free reign. But I'm guessing he feels confident enough that he'll be able to get the anti-air out later. That, that is probably his thought pattern. Either that or he just forgot, you know, we all do that sometimes. So now he's sending an infantry towards the middle, much too late though, because I've already started capturing here. So even though he's ahead of me in income right now, 11,000 to my 9,000, I am going to start to catch up to him in income at some point. So here in comes my Battlecopter. The first thing it does is just shoot on the infantry. Uh, I know that he already knows that I have the, the Battlecopters. I don't, I don't bother with any like stealth maneuvers, like trying to quietly send it around behind the mountains and like do a surprise attack on him. I know that he knows that it's coming. So I'm just going to get as much value out of this Battlecopter as I possibly can before I have to pull it away. Now, when you use Battlecopters in Advanced Wars, always, always, always pull them away after the first attack, unless you know that the opponent has no anti-air. Never, ever, ever leave your Battlecopter in the same location for prolonged periods of time because your opponent will build an anti-air. Every single opponent will, will respond with an anti-air when you come out with a Battlecopter. So attack with it and pull it back. Pull it away and force your opponent to get another anti-air out elsewhere. And that way you've already forced him to spend 16,000 in response to your 9,000, which is effective. Now, I know I throw the, the term value and cost effective out or, uh, around a lot when I do these replay commentaries. And just in case you're, you haven't watched a lot of competitive multiplayer casting before, when I say value, that's basically referring to the value of the units right here. So for example, you can see that I, just see up in the top right corner of the screen here, you can see that I have a combined value of 27,000. That, that's the combined value of all my troops. He has a combined value of 33,000. So his value is slightly higher than mine at this point. 
Now, when I say effective and cost effective, it means that I take engagements that are cost effective. Like for example, a mech taking out an anti-air, that's insanely effective. That's a unit worth 3,000 taking out a unit worth 8,000. So that's statistically very effective. If you can do a lot of trades like that, you will be able to come out on top. Now, me moving in a tank, shooting down an infantry worth 1,000, and then having that tank shot by an artillery and get destroyed, that's not very cost effective. I just traded a unit worth 7,000 for an enemy unit worth 1,000. So when I say effective, cost, like value, terms like that, I'm talking about the price of the unit. This sounds a little callous, but when you play Advanced Wars, you have to envision your troops not as like actual human soldiers, but like bags of money walking about, and you want to prioritize them accordingly, you know? A bag of money worth 7,000 is a lot more valuable than a bag of money worth 1,000. You know, you can sacrifice the bag of money worth 1,000. In Advanced Wars, we're all like sociopaths, and we treat our units uh, in terms of their, their costs. So yeah, just, just, you know, I thought I'd get that out of the way so you understand. Anyway. Um, so, um, I shoot him in, uh, on his infantry, and I take down his infantry, putting my own in the mountain. Again, always want to utilize that vision whenever you can, and I move in. I really am hell-bent on getting this tower right now, because I have one tower. I'll be in a winning position if I can just prevent him from taking this tower, but if I can somehow get the tower, then that's an even better position to be in, and I realize that this might actually be a possibility at this point, so I'm going for it. I continue to capture. Uh, this infantry probably should have gone in and assisted in the center. This infantry could have gone and take this this property later on, so a little bit annoying that I didn't do that. I send my recon up and I take a shot at his infantry. At this point, I don't see the tank hidden in the woods, so but I probably should have realized that he was there. But now I also have vision on the airport, so I'll be able to see if he gets a battlecopter out, which is very useful. And continuing to move my units, and I build a tank. Um, I realized that at this point, you know, this is how the, the, the battle in Advanced Wars go. You build Battlecopter, they build Anti-Air, you build Tank. They build Battlecopter, you build Anti-Air, they build Tank. So it's like rock, paper, scissor, you know? You have to counter their counter to your counter to your counter to their counter to your counter. And whoever can counter the opponent's counter unit the most wins. Basically how it goes. So that's kind of like the eternal cycle of Advanced Wars. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but in most small-scale battles, this is usually how it goes. So right now we're even in terms of income, but, and I actually have a little bit more value than him, but he hasn't deployed his units yet, so he's actually leading in terms of value. Now here comes the anti air out, and this is the second big mistake that he makes in this match. Why, oh why did he not deploy this anti air on this base instead of this base? On this base, look at the movement range of the anti air. On this base, it would have already been able to reach this battlecopter. So I don't understand why he felt the need to deploy it here. Um, maybe he wanted to keep it hidden. That could have been the case. Maybe he thought I had a recon here and he didn't want, he didn't want the, want me to see the entire coming but here's the thing every player that has a battlecopter out on field will expect an entire coming so there's no there's no reason to hide this entire uh, you like of course i understand it's going to show up at some point so uh him putting this further back to hide it actually like was not a good idea for him that it's it, it actually ended up hurting him a lot so here comes the tank it takes a shot on my recon uh at this point this recon is as good as useless so it's time to just pull it back and he sends out a recon of his own. I did think I see this coming, because if you pay attention on the enemy turn, you can see their un units move about, and that can give you some additional info. So definitely, if you're playing a very intensive match, definitely pay attention on their turn as well. It's tempting to minimize the browser and go do something else, but you want to pay attention to the opponent's movements when you play. So he takes a shot at me here. If he rolled a really good luck roll, he probably could have taken it out. So this was good on his end. And now he's really doing something weird. He's moving his recons in. Knowing there's a Battlecopter here, probably feeling confident that this Battlecopter will be warded away by, the, by this anti-air, he's actually really overextending here, he's sending both of his recons in and attacking me on the right-hand side here. I was really puzzled by this move. Now, it looks pretty good on paper, uh, but really he's gonna end up getting his recons trapped, and losing both of your recons, that's not good. You need those units quite a lot, so... Uh, he builds another mech. Again, he built a lot of mechs in this match. But funnily enough, the mechs actually didn't end up doing that much for him. You'll see what I mean later on. So, once again, he's doing pretty good. He's, he continues to build infantry in his bases. Uh, very good on him. Uh, he's certainly not... He's not doing the mistake of, like, not utilizing his bases, which is, you know, the, the hallmarks of a skilled player. Here, uh, I continue to take good engagements against his infantry, and I start capturing my second property in the middle. So far, he has completely ignored his two properties in the middle. He probably could have taken both of them at this point, and he would have had a big income lead over me. So, really big mistake for him to just neglect the middle this way. He really wanted to focus all of his attention on the comm towers, which I kind of understand why he did, did that, but it's a little too late at this point. At this point, he probably should have just conceded that he wouldn't get this comm tower, and rather tried to go for the income lead. So yeah, I move my infantry forward, 
I don't see an anti-air, and even if, it, if an anti-air is on this base, it will only be able to reach here, so I am comfortable trapping both of his recons right here. And uh, yeah, I just start shooting them down, and both of these recons are going to be pretty useless next turn, so I feel confident in starting to cap the comm tower just to put a little bit of pressure on him, and I take a little bit of a shot at his infantry in the mountains, because why not? And time to get more tanks out on the field, I see that. Again, recons, anti-air, you know, both units that a tank can deal with pretty well. And yeah, like, don't be afraid to just move your infantry and just cap in front of a tank. Like, even if he he has to, even if he uses his tank to interrupt the cap, that means that he just locked up a unit worth a 7,000 to take down one of my units worth a 1,000. So, if I can make this tank shoot on this infantry, mission accomplished. This infantry has done its job. Even if I don't get the... Oh, I skipped the entire turn. My bad. Sorry, let me do that again. Um, even, if, uh, even if the uh, infantry doesn't end up capturing the city, keeping a tank busy for an entire turn, that's more than worth it. Like, that tank should be off doing more important things than shooting on an infantry. So I am completely fine with doing this. Again, pulling my recon back here. Again, when, it, when a recon is at 1 HP, pull it back, use it for scouting. Don't get it killed. Like, that 1 HP recon can still see as far as a full HP recon. It's still very useful if it's just used for scouting. And hell, you never know. It could be used for something more than that. Maybe you could use it to block a base in the future or whatnot. Or maybe block one of your own units. Always keep your 1 HP units in reserve. Try to be as valuable as them with them as humanly possible. So, uh, day 9 rolls in. And uh, right now, you will see him make a couple of massive mistakes. So, he starts off pretty well. He, he interrupts my... He interrupts my, my infantry with this recon, which I understand why, but I think it would have been better if he, if he did this with this infantry instead. But um, he also goes for my comm tower. You can tell he really wants to grab that comm tower now, but he doesn't have enough infantry in the region to really make this feasible. So, But he, he takes a couple of really good shots at me, and he manages to interrupt my cap, which is pretty good for him. And here comes the anti-air. I do see it coming, uh, but he is probably pretty confident that he'll be able to shield it from my tank. So, he takes two shots at my infantry capping the tower, and here comes the second or third massive mistake that he makes in this match. Instead of going down here and interrupting the cap, he decides to send this infantry to interrupt this cap right here. He had a mech. He could have sent this mech down, scouted the forest, made sure it was nothing there, and then he could have moved this infantry down. Whatever you do, always, always, always interrupt the comm towers. They are the most important objective to take on any map. Um, this actually, probably this move right here ended up costing him the match. So uh, he moves in right here, and he really doesn't want, want to let me have this property, which I get, it's cool, but this comm tower, le letting this 7 HP infantry take the comm tower is way more detrimental. So here comes the Botocopter out, and that's pretty good on him, like a Botocopter is statistically very important to have in this area, and I don't see it coming either because I don't have a recon. So that's a really good move on his end. Finally! Finally, on day 9, he sends his infantry down to take these two properties. Way too late. He's also neglected this property in his area for a very long time, al along with this property. He actually has two neutral properties on his side of the map, which he has not taken yet, because he's so busy building mechs and sending them towards me that he's neglecting capturing. So this is why I say mech spamming can sometimes hurt you. Yeah, mechs are great units, and on this terrain, if there was more of a battle going on in the center of this map, the mechs would have been insanely good. But... He's neglecting two properties. These two properties could have been capped for many days now, providing him with a big income lead. Look at my income. 14,000 to his 12,000. Even though his value is a lot higher than mine right now, he actually has a pretty big value lead right now of almost 10,000, or I think it's like 11,000. But I have 2,000 more income than him, and this is slowly going to start to build up over the course of the match and tilt that uh, advantage in my favor. So he builds another mech. Again, he really spams his mechs this map, but they actually didn't end up doing that much for him. And now he finally realizes, oh, I gotta, I gotta go, go take this property now, I can't leave this one here. And, uh, yeah, you're about to see one of the most important turns come up very soon. I think day 10, day, day 11, I think, is like the big turn, but... So, here, I capture this comm tower, it's now down to 3 HP, he has to interrupt this cap now, he cannot leave it unattended any longer. Uh, I do what I can to... I, I basically here, I just target this infantry because I just don't want him to take this comm tower. I've almost resigned myself to the fact that he will get this comm tower on the left-hand side right here, but I don't care. Uh, as long as... If I can take this comm tower and prevent him from getting this one, that'd be good for me, honestly. So, um, once again, I just move up my infantry. I just cap the city. And I just go like, hey, if you want to waste your time attacking this infantry, then go ahead. Like, you can lock up your 4,000 recon to attack my 1,000 infantry if you want. I don't care. And I'm continuing to move into the center here. I'm setting up for a really good turn next turn. Like, the next turn is going to be insane, guys. Um, so, I take down his infantry on the mountain, limiting his vision. 
finish off his 1 HP recon, and now I pull my Battlecopter back to take down his 3 HP recon. This is not only something I do to kill the recon, I also know an Antire is coming. I can't see it, but I know it's coming. Any player with two brain cells would have deployed an Antire by this point, so I'm pulling my, my Battlecopter not only back to kill the recon, but also to get it out of range of the Antire. Again, this is so important. When you have Battlecopters, you have to keep them alive. You cannot leave them hanging around on the front lines. They will be shot down. 100% they will be shot down. So pull it back, and then once I'm done with this recon, I can pull the Battlecopter into the center where there's no anti-air, where it can have free reign to do whatever it wants. It can scout, it can interrupt caps, it can take out units. Um, always do this. Build Battlecopter, send them to front line, do damage, pull back, send them elsewhere. This is how you want to use them. So now his second recon is dead, he has no ice anymore, and I send my tank up to take a shot at his infantry here, and then I get really mad because I see he has a mech in the mountain here, so next turn, he's gonna have the dream scenario, you know, this is what we all love, you know, mech going into mountain, shooting down the tank, I mean, this is what we live for, right? Um, I send my tank up, my infantry, and I build another tank, and look, look at how many tanks I have compared to him right now, one, two, three, four tanks to his one. He has a lot of mechs that are not really doing a whole lot, he has a battlecopter, which will be very useful, he has one mech and a recon, and an anti-air that is not really doing much. So right now, even though our values are very similar, 49,000, they're actually exactly similar. I just saw this right now, 49,900 to 49,900. So we're actually completely evenly matched right now, except for the fact that I have a 3,000 income lead. Um, I would say that my unit composition is better than his. We have equally many units, but I have more tanks and tanks are just more useful right now. These mechs are just kind of sitting here not doing anything at the moment. So once again, I build uh, more infantry, and uh, day 10 now rolls in. So now he does a very strange move with his Battlecopter. He is overly scared right here. So he has his Battlecopter here. He probably suspects that there is an anti-air here. There isn't though, but he probably suspects there is, so he only moves over here. Never do these half measures. Either you go in with the Battlecopter and you take a gamble, or you send your Battlecopter elsewhere. So what I would have done in this situation, if I'm too scared to move down here with my Battlecopter, I would have sent it straight to the right-hand side and used it to take control in the center. You don't want to use this half thing where you're like, eh, kind of want to move the unit a little bit, but maybe not. Either you, either you commit or you don't commit. You don't go halfway. Because this Battlecopter right here is just kind of sitting back. I, I'm guessing he wants, he wants to see if he can reveal my Antire before moving it in, which I can understand that. But this Battlecopter just spent a turn doing nothing. And right now, every turn counts. Every single turn counts. He needs to take this Comm Tower. He needs to prevent me from taking this Comm Tower. It's so important. He cannot afford to, like, dilly-dally in the back lines with this Battlecopter here. So, once again, now he moves his infantry in. And I'm, I'm, I'm betting he's very confident that he's going to get this, this, this Comm Tower right now. Because he has a tank and a recon blocking it off. Little does he know that I have a sneaky little Special Forces infantry hidden in this forest right here that is poised perfectly to interrupt that cap. Imagine if instead of moving here with this Battlecopter, he moved it down here. To, in, to prevent me from going through the back door here. That would have been a very good move. That probably would have won in the, won in the comm tower, but because he was hesitant, he decided to move his Battlecopter here instead, where it's basically not doing anything. So, um, he moves in with some more infantry, interrupts my cap, that's fine. He joins his infantry together there, and interrupts my cap, that's all fine. And now he gets the dream dream trade right here. Mech from the mountain against tank. That's what we all love to see. That is like, the, that's the best feeling ever right there. Mechs and mountains, man, how, how do you deal with them? It is annoying. He says his mech over here into the forest. I don't really know why he just didn't leave it in the mountain. Kind of weird. I guess, yeah, no, he wanted to attack with this mech, I guess. So he's setting up his mechs here. Now, um, I don't know what he's doing here. Why did he move his entire over there? Interrupt the goddamn comm tower. Like, I don't actually care. I don't care if it if it's gonna end up costing you your entire. Like, I actually don't don't care. Um, you want to you want to interrupt this cap. Yeah, this entire is worth 8,000, and if you move it in to interrupt this cap, then uh, sure, it will be get shot down, but at the same time, you cannot let your opponent get this comm tower. I think his reasoning now was that I'm gonna get this comm tower, so I'm fine with letting him get his comm tower. I think he was so confident that he was gonna get this comm tower on the left-hand side right here, that he actually just threw this comm tower to me. Because he would rather keep his Antair alive. But, do you see it, guys? Okay, look at the screen right now. Do you see the massive flaw in his movement right now? He made probably the most game-breaking mistake of all. Just look at the screen. Can you, can you see the mistake? Well, perceptive players may have noticed this tank right here, right? But oh no, it's not in range. Well, well, did you forget who I was playing? Mr. Sideslip. 
Hydra's just gonna sideslip his tank behind enemy lines and uh, be really annoying. So yeah, look at that. That is a perfect sideslip right there. Tank is gonna be in range next turn. Take down the Empire, what happens then? This Battlecopter, completely uncontested. This Battlecopter becomes an attack helicopter. It, it, it would basically just wreck your day. So, uh, he finally captures this property that is like right next to his base, that's good. And he builds an artillery, which honestly, in this situation, I would think I would probably not get this artillery out, but on this map, it, there's no doubt that artillery are pretty strong. There's tons of amazing locations to hide them. Like artillery here would be great, and artillery here would be great. Just in the center, the artillery would be insanely good. And artillery hidden in this forest would be incredibly good. So lots of really good hiding spots for indirects right now, but I would say it's a little too late. He builds another recon. Um, he's, I, I guess he just really wants that vision. He's worried that this recon might get taken down. So here, ladies and gentlemen, probably one of the best side slips I've ever performed. So here we go, outer side slip is activated and just look at the carnage. So first of all, I want you to look at the cost difference between our army right now. He actually has a pretty significant income lead over me. So he has 56 value over my 45. Now the value doesn't update until the end of the turn, but just remember these numbers and, and just see how much this value will shift during this turn. This is the power of plus one movement for the cost of two stars, ladies and gentlemen. So first things first, I actually remembered to capture my comb tower this time around, so yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. I didn't make that mistake again. So right now, I have a 20% firepower increase. My units are max tier right now, or dual strike just tier. They are super scary. In addition to that, they all have plus one move. The first thing I do is I take a really good engagement against his tank with my tank. Puts it down to 4 HP. Then I move through the back door and I say, no comm tower for you, my friend, and I interrupt that. And he has an infantry to reinforce next turn, but still he's statistically not going to get this tower now. I move in with another tank, and I also use my extra movement to take this property in the center. I move in my infantry to take a really good shot at his infantry, so now his, he has no presence in the center anymore. And here I move in my recon to scout out, and I see that, ooh, I have a clear path to his entire ain't that great, I move in my tank, and BAM! 2 HP anti-air, this anti-air is as good as useless right now, it can't even do that much damage to my Battlecopters. I can even kill it with my Battlecopter, but I decide to go for his mech instead, because why not? And I also move in, and uh, I start capping this property as well. So now I'm really moving into the center here, uh, I'm pushing my income lead quite heavily in my favor. I continue taking this final property right here, and I move in my tank. Uh, this move, honestly, looking back at it, I probably could have used this tank to be more aggressive, but with these mechs in the mountains, I figured it was kind of better to just pull the tank back and maybe it could be more useful elsewhere. Again, mechs can't really attack you if you're not in their range, so sometimes you can just maneuver around them. And I keep shooting here. And uh, yeah, moving in my infantry, taking a shot at this tank. I got a really good luck roll there. I took two HP off it, so I'm really happy about that. And moving my 1 HP recon just to scout out the path ahead and see what's coming my way. I build another tank and another Battlecopter because now there's no anti-air to challenge me here. So now I'm just going to dominate the skies right here. And look at the income disparity right now. Or, sorry, look at the value difference. You remember how much I had before this turn began? I was like 12,000 beneath him. Look at that. 19,000 value above him. So that is probably one of the most devastating turns ever. I just, basically, the, the scales were like here on him, and after my turn, it's like, boom, tipped in completely the different direction. So this is the power of either side slip on a small map. Sometimes getting that plus one move, of course, it was backed up by the fact that I also got a comm tower on the same turn, but still, man, never underestimate the value of plus one movement in Advanced Force. It can really win you matches. So, he moves his artillery over here. I mean, I don't think this is going to do much, but... Uh, here comes his Battlecopter, though. He finally decides to take a gamble. He, he realizes there might be an anti-air here, but now he's just deciding to go, okay, I need to do something here. If there's an anti-air here, there's an anti-air here. I guess it's GG. So now he's just taking the gamble, and it ended up paying off for him because there's no anti-air here. I built a tank, so um, really good. Like, imagine if he had done this one turn sooner. Well, if he had, maybe I would have built. Maybe I wouldn't have built the tank, so. so. He traps himself on the recon right here, and uh, he moves his recon down as well, and here he does another massive mistake. So, not that, he shoots me, but he moves this infantry away. He doesn't join cap. Why not join cap? Capture with your infantry and join together. Join capping is one of the most important things you can do in competitive advanced wars. Join capping basically keeps up the pressure on that building and means that I have to divert more of my resources to interrupt the cap. Next turn, I can just kill this infantry with my infantry. It's not going to be a big deal. If he had join capped, I would need to divert a tank to also interrupt this cap. So, 
Again, massive, massive problem right here. Always join cap. He wants to interrupt this cap for some reason. It's not really a big deal. Get the comm tower, man. Get the comm tower. So incredibly important. So here he pulls his entire back for repairs. I'm guessing he thinks because he's Rachel, he's going to get some more value out of the repairs. But nah, I would not do this. I would just put this entire in a forest, use it to scout. Uh, it's never really going to be valuable anymore. So he does get two pretty good shots uh, on my tank, though, with his mechs. I get a good luck roll on my counterattack there, though, and uh, I take out his mech on the counterattack, so that's pretty good. And he starts to capture, capture the city, which, is, that's okay. And for some reason, I'm guessing he, he wants to try and go for my HQ here. I don't really know if he thought this was going to succeed, but that's fine with me. And he continues to move his mechs into the mountain. Again, you see how little value he's getting out of these mechs in the mountains right here? There's nothing for them to do here. There's no tanks for them to shoot at. There's there's nothing for them to do. They're just kind of like wandering around aimlessly. This is what I say. Mech spamming, not always the best solution in, in some matches. In this match, he ended up building a lot of mechs and they didn't really end up doing anything. So he builds a second entire. This makes sense. He probably realizes the second battlecopter is coming now and he needs he needs an entire to reinforce his damage entire. So this, is, this makes complete sense. Again, he builds another mech. What's the point? What's the point? This mech isn't going to be useful. It, it, again, he was way too fond of building his mechs this map. Uh, he is going to lose. If he loses the comm towers, he loses the match. And the mechs are, are not going to catch up in time. He doesn't have any APCs to transport them to the front lines. Uh, so this is... I don't understand why he kept building mechs. I would much rather build... Yeah, again, another mech right here. You see, this is really costing him the match right here. Because he's already losing his presence around both the comm towers. And these mechs, they're not going to reach those places in time to be effective. So again, his mech spamming actually ended up hurting him a lot here. So, however, however, it's not in the bag for me yet, because as you can see, that covering fire is coming up, and that is going to be devastating. So I realized that even though I'm in a pretty good position to win right here, I have to press my advantage against them. I cannot let up this aggression. I cannot start turtling. I need to push him right now before that covering fire comes into play. It's probably going to come in anyway. Like, it's going to come in next turn, because I'm going to kill stuff. So I move in my tank, and here I actually decide to forego my capture to go for his HQ. And the reason why I'm doing this is mostly just to rattle him. I know he has units in the vicinity. I know he's going to be able to interrupt it. But sometimes if you go for an HQ cap, you can actually end up rattling your opponent and make them overreact. And I figured, you know, he I was sweating quite profusely in this match. So I realized that he's probably sweating as well. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to make him sweat even more. And I'm actually going to go for his HQ cap, even though it means foregoing a city. Because I'm already in I already have an income lead over him. I'm actually okay with sacking a city just to, just to pressure him a little bit. So sometimes, don't underestimate the psychological impact that your, that your actions can have on your opponents. So, so I move in here, and boom, I interrupt this cap. I still have both comm towers. I have a 20% firepower over him. Every turn that he lets me have two comm towers is a turn that he is losing. He has to take those comm towers back. If he doesn't, he is toast. So I join cap right here to get this city. And I move my second battlecopter in and see what I'm doing here. I am just avoiding this area with my Battlecopter Shroud because I know an anti is coming in. I can't see it, but I know he built it. Of course he built it. I just took out his anti and there's a Battlecopter. Of course he's going to build an anti I don't need a recon to scout that out. I know it's coming. So what am I doing? Well, these mountains right here is preventing this anti from coming to their rescue. So, And I see he has infantry here, so sure, I'm just going to attack him with my Battlecopters. And here I decide to sack this tank just to ensure that his anti-air can't come back. If I let this repair and go up to 5 HP, and it will go up to 5 HP because he's playing Rachel. If I let this anti-air come back, it could take a good shot on my Battlecopter. So I'm like, you know what? I'm okay with sacking this 5 HP tank just to get rid of your 2 HP anti-air. I'm actually okay with that. And yeah, I, boom, I move both of my, my Battlecopters just away. I don't need them in this area anymore. In fact, I'm happy pulling these Battlecopters over to, to the left si left-hand side right now, because there's no Antire here, aside from one Battlecopter. So, again, always do this. Send them away. Don't leave them hanging in a single area. So, um, yep, moving my uh, Recon away, and here in comes my tanks. I have such a tank presence right here now that he really doesn't have a response to it. Even, even though he has an uncontested Battlecopter right here, there's just so many tanks that he just... There's nothing he can do. So I take, I take two shots at his tank right here, and uh, I'm kind of sad that I didn't get a good luck rolls on both my infantry, but one of them was at 5 HP, so their luck wasn't as high. Uh, I send my, again, I, I move my recon back. I refuse to give him this recon. I refuse to sacrifice this recon. This recon is giving me so much vision. It's being so effective, even though it's just at 1 HP. I will keep this alive for as long as I can. 
And here comes the Antire, of course. I, I do need some response to his Barakopter. I don't just want to leave it there and give it three shots every turn. That would be really bad for me. And once again, I keep, I keep up the trend of always building infantry whenever possible. So day 12 rolls in and here comes the covering fire. You don't see the graphics, but you certainly see where the missile landed. <coughs> so the missile seems to have hit here. It actually hits his own, hit his own units, I think. And I do believe the missile also hit his HQ. And the third missile must have landed here, I think. I think it may have landed here, but it, I, I could, I, let's go back and actually see. So, uh, let's skip the turn. All right, let's see, yeah, no, no, yeah. So one missile here, one missile here, and then one missile here. So boom, yeah, so it, it did hit, as you can see right here, the missile can hit Rachel's own units. And when it does that, it will simply just detract the cost of those units from the total value. So, um, I don't think the value update, yeah, okay, so there you can see the value actually updating in real time right here. So I had 62,000 value, which is a lot compared to Rachel's value of 39,000. Had a lot of value, covering fire gets popped, boom, almost 10,000 value just shaved off my army right there. You see how valuable that is? You see how strong that is? Like, that's a lot. That's a lot. Like, I was able to get a pretty big uh, value lead as well when I popped my side slip, but that's just like, boom. And it's an incredibly strong power. It's very cheap, too. So, uh, and then he moves in, tries to interrupt my caps. Uh, he also s almost successfully interrupts my HQ cap, but then he resigns because he realizes there's nothing he can do here. Um, so, yeah, this was an incredibly fun match. Like, probably one of the most enjoyable matches I've had in a very long while. Can we actually see the stats here? Um, this is very interesting. So we can actually, I love this post battle report right here. Really cool. So, um, I don't understand. This seems a little odd to me. I don't think I generated this much money. You might want to fix this advanced force by web, but I do believe that this, these are the amount of units that I killed. And this is the amount of units that I lost, I think. I'm not entirely sure how this works. But yeah, anyway. Um, so this, this match was incredibly enjoyable. Uh, this was clearly a very high skill level player. He did a lot of really good plays, but he also did some mistakes. You know, he didn't go for the comm towers uh, enough. Uh, he let me have a comm tower, which you should never ever let your opponent have a comm tower. And he also did, made the horrible mistake of uh, forgetting to, to count Adder's plus one movement that he gets from his side slip. That was probably the, the mistake that cost him the match. He also uh, did not capture properties. Like, this property is still uncaptured after 12 days, and he, he has not taken a single one of the middle properties. So I just ended up getting a huge income lead over him. But honestly, what did cost him the match was that side slip. When I popped that side slip, I got so many good engagements. He just lost so much value. He was never really able to recover after that. And even after the covering fire, it just wasn't enough to tilt the match in his favor. It would be too long until he got his second covering fire. And I'm actually kind of glad that he resigned. Like, this is something that new players don't tend to do. Uh, as much as I understand your willingness to go on and fight to the last, and especially when you're playing against someone that you watch on YouTube and you're enjoying the match, it's still, I think, considered very polite to resign when you're behind, because at that point, you're kind of just wasting your opponent's time, like, making them play, like, 15 extra turns when they've already won. Uh, this is why I think most matches in Advanced Wars should have a time limit by default, and I do believe, I, I think I set a time limit of, like, 25 days. I usually tend to set the time limit of, like, 20 to 25 days, depending on how big the map is. So, uh, just something to take into consideration. I'm very glad he resigned, even though I did enjoy this match immensely. I was a little surprised, actually, that he resigned so quickly, but I, now looking at the map right here, I do see why he didn't want to fight on anymore. But, yeah, no, this was a fantastic match. One of the most enjoyable ones I've had in a long time. It was super fun, and Buttercup, boy, you played really well, and I'd love to play you again sometime. So, yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this briefly commentary. It was a lot longer than the last one because I wanted to go much more into detail with this one and show you all the little things that happen here. And hopefully, I, I hope you guys can appreciate just how high the skill ceiling is in Advanced Wars. Like, it's ridiculous how high the skill ceiling is. Like, little tiny mistakes will end up costing you the match. And really, like, I... I'm so glad that there's a place online where we can play competitive Advanced Wars, but I am even more excited to be able to do this in real time. Uh, as fun as Advanced Wars by Web is, and as much as I'm going to continue playing on there, and I'm probably going to keep playing on there even after the reboot comes out, but 
uh, I really just want the competitive advanced for scene so badly. Uh, I'm enjoying this so much. It's so much fun. Ah, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy that, that Advanced Wars is finally getting some recognition in 2021. It is honestly the best thing that has happened all year. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll be going on vacation right now. By the time this video is up, I will be up in the mountains enjoying uh, the nice weather alongside Panzergraf and another friend. And yeah, um, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Uh, keep challenging me. I'm, I'm taking on all, all challengers. Uh, and remember to slash that like comment. Like, like, comment, and subscribe, but I, just, I don't know how this works. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!